Welcome. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and we've got uh, some really interesting material to share today on security in DevOps. And Johnny is, is helping me in the chat for uh, the resources that we share. We always like to share resources in our webinars. And if you have not checked out our webinar archives, then you definitely need to do that. Go to the Clear Measure website and, and uh, check out the archives. We have um, so many over the years. And uh, today we're going to talk about DevSecOps. Um, it doesn't really roll off your tongue, but it's really intentionally thinking about um, being resilient to security threats in your DevOps environment, in your DevOps process. And so we're going to go through how to think about that. All right. So um, as we go through, just a little bit about Clear Measure, just in case uh, this is your first webinar. We are a Texas-based um, or Texas headquartered software architecture company that is empowering software delivery, enabling in-house .NET teams to be self-sufficient, able to move fast, deliver quality, and to run your systems with confidence. Um, we uh, we we have we have staff um, all over the country, in addition to some in Canada, and uh, we actually are hiring architects as well as .NET engineers who would like to become an architect. So you can go to our career page um, if interested, and we focus on the uh, Microsoft development technologies. That's what we do. So a uh, little bit about myself. Um, actually, yesterday was my 20th wedding anniversary. So that's uh, a big milestone. We also love to do amateur dirt bike racing and we kind of live uh, out in the country uh, to the west of Austin, Texas. And that's my boy changing a, changing a tube on his dirt bike. Um, and so we like to do outdoor stuff. All right, our agenda for today, today's session, uh, we're going to talk about the thinking around integrating security into DevOps. Uh, we're going to talk about the different uh, different areas that are pertinent to software development, physical security, code security, document security, um, deployment security. We're also going to talk about the STRIDE model, which is an acronym uh, you may or may not have heard of. And then we're also going to talk about runtime security. Okay, um, now as we go through here, um, I'm going to launch a uh, launch a poll, and I believe you should be seeing it on the screen. The question is: Are you using security in DevOps? Uh, yes or no, or a little bit, or somewhere, or maybe one application, but not the other. Um, and so, just take a minute and just click on the relevant uh, click on the relevant button there, and um, it's okay. It's okay if a, if a little is a, a vague vague answer, um, because you know it takes it takes a lot of effort here. All right. So as we move forward, um, and I'll go on go on to the next slide. Looks like the answers are still rolling in. Just a couple seconds. If you have not already answered it, and three, two, one. All right. Let's move forward. Okay. So. Uh, next slide. Um, I I like to offer uh, you know typically my my books for for uh, for free electronic copy. If you want to send me an email, you can get a free electronic copy of my last book .NET DevOps for Azure. You can also you can also buy it anywhere books are sold. Another resource you may be interested in is the Azure DevOps podcast. You can go to www.azuredevops.show for that. Uh, we cover everything related to shipping software and um, and we've also launched a um, a new video podcast called programming with palermo I actually didn't put it in here because it's late breaking but you can just do an internet search for programming with palermo and find that all right so let's get into the seven key elements of a DevSecOps environment and let's start uh, let's start with the general way of thinking all right, so I'm going to pull up our um, our a diagram we've used for lots of different things, which is our model for DevOps architecture. And this is actually only the top third of it. Um, unless you have a full size monitor, you're not going to be able to read the text. But this is the full poster. It's meant to be printed in high resolution on a two foot by three foot poster board. Uh, so actually, if anyone would like the full high resolution um, poster file, the PDFs, so that you can get it printed at a print shop. 
just uh, email me or put it in the chat or and, and we'd be happy to send it to you. But let me highlight a few things in the top third as we go through here. Um, the, regular, the regular DevOps process always includes a private build on your Git repository. Then you have an integration build that's team-based on some type of build server that's taking the, the code branches from any changes from any developer, integrating them together and making sure that your build script still runs, all your unit tests, your integration tests, whatever levels of testing you have in that. So it's not just a compile, it's much more than that code analysis. And then you're creating packaged up release candidates and you're putting them for .NET, you're putting them in a NuGet server. Azure Artifacts is great for that. Um, it could be as simple as zip files, but you need a name and numbered uh, release candidate. Okay, and then we deploy along a, a DevOps pipeline and you need at least three environments for that. You have production, you have manual test environment, and then you have an automated test environment. You can have as many of each of those types as you want to. But when you're thinking about security, think of it just like any other feature of software. Security is not just this hand wavy thing where we say, I don't want a bad thing to happen. That's not, of course we don't want bad things to happen. Of course we don't want a data breach. Of course, we don't want unauthorized people accessing any part of our system. Duh, we don't want bad things to happen. But that's not that's not a plan. Okay, um, when uh, for for user experience, we might also say, I want the application to be easy to use. That's a goal. Okay, so to say I don't want a breach or I want to make my application secure. Well, that's a goal, you know, the absence of a breach. Okay, it's been secure so far. Um, but the, the way to think about it is just like any other product management activity. You know, you're going to have the right, the right people making these determinations, educated people who are, who are studying the threats out there. But you want to put the security features in your backlog and you want to write the code for those features. You want to write automated tests for those features. You want to test them in your build. You want to deploy those security features. You want to test those security features, verify those security features, and deploy them to production and monitor those security features. Let me give an example. Um, we don't want unauthorized people to be able to access the application. Well, one of the one of the simple ways that the, the banking industry has um, has combated this is by locking out accounts and making it impossible to not do it just a constant brute force guess the password attack on a login screen. Whereas, you know, the attackers, one of the, one of the very, very common banks and credit unions are constantly getting attacked, uh, guessing email addresses, guessing usernames, and then just trying to use dictionary attacks on the password over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, one way to combat it is to add two-factor authentication with a text message or a phone call or security questions. And that's great, but, um, uh, an, another way to even back up from that is to not allow some number of incorrect password attempts within a particular time window. And what effectively, what are we doing? We're detecting that we may have an active attack, okay? So the software feature would have some business logic. The software feature would say, would record when we had a bad password attempt, and then when we had another pass, bad password attempt, we'd look at the last time we had a bad one, look at the timing in between, and then, and then choose. Do we want to allow them two quick bad passwords, three, four, five, you know, how many? Because you want to differ from an actual person that lost their password to a, a bot, which is just jamming attempts, trying to guess the password, all right? That's a security feature and disable the account, send an alert, things like that. And so systems used by banks and credit unions, that's one of the common solutions. That's one of the common security features that they put in. But any of your attack vectors, you want to think about the risk and, and it's the same product management activities. Design a security feature that has a chance to either minimize the risk of, of a possibility occurring or minimize the impact if the risk actually does occur. All right, so that's the thinking of DevSecOps. So any of the conversation when someone says, oh, we just need it to be secure. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That's a goal. Just like I want the software to be easy to use. 
that's a goal. But you can't tell the programmers, make it easy to use. All right. You have to actually decide what what easy to use means, uh, make some hypotheses, uh, banter around a little bit and determine what you're going to do. And then you build it in using the same DevOps process you would uh, um, you would anyway. Um, this includes firewall rules, network configurations in Azure. Um, you know, that's defined in code, whether it's ARM templates or Terraform. Uh, and so everything, everything can and should be tested. So that's how to think about DevSecOps. Now, um, another thing that you should also assume, and this is, this is really true, you should assume that attacks are always happening. And if you've had a system that has any kind of online surface area at all, then you know that that's true, you, you experienced it. Um, if any of you have just as simple as a public WordPress website, go look at your logs. There is constantly people trying to sniff out if you have a WordPress plugin with a known security vulnerable vulnerability, and they're trying those known um, URL paths to see if they can hack into your website. It's always happening. There's bots scouring the net, trying to find known surface area. So just assume that it's always happening because it is. And then um, when it comes to the development team, we've, we've already talked about that and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But every user of your software needs to go through some security, some security training. Um, even even the basics. We love Know Before as a curriculum for, for training every user. And it starts with basic things like um, knowing how to spot a email that is made to look like it comes from someone in your organization, but is really a phishing email. And it also has cur curriculum, video training, um, and uh, another, uh, another resource is staysafeonline.org. I'd recommend this for everybody as well as your family members. And it's put out by the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And October is coming up. October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so um, even if it's only your family, uh, you can send them some of the resources. But attacks are always happening. Okay, let's talk about physical security. Um, an example threat is files and data on a lost computer. And some of your uh, some of your tools against that is to make sure that, that that computer is actually joined to a domain or to Microsoft 365 um, where it can be sometimes located, but remote wiped and um, remote locked where you can't really, uh, you have, if someone's going to try to brute force their way in the normal way, they have to go through the connected authentication processes you can see that there's failed attempts and it can be remotely managed. Um, and, and then another tool is BitLocker. Um, if they just take the hard drive out of that computer and connect it to, uh, to an external, external dock or external cable, if the drive is encrypted with BitLocker, that's a defense against that type of threat. If the hard drive is not encrypted, then they're going to get all your files. And, uh, you know, with, with, Dropbox and OneDrive and Google Drive and so many, so many shared drives synchronized over to computers. Uh, the the threat there is actually a little bit bigger than it is if you're inside of a building on a network that works off of network drives, where the files aren't synchronized and copied over. Uh, now, um, it's it's not on here, but one of the mitigations that you can do as a policy, if this works for your organization is to make sure that all of your users do install, uh, or if you install it for them, install those uh, drive agents, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, and make sure to enable the feature that only pulls over the files as they use them instead of proactively synchronizing all of the files. And that's getting more and more common in order to save hard drive space, but that is just something, something to be sure of. Um, because that can, that can lessen the impact if data is breached. If a computer, for some reason, did not have BitLocker and they just pulled the hard drive out, and now we have access to some files, that it actually reduces the number of files that we get access to. And then also, so many more people are working remotely, working from home, and the threat uh, 
is a breach on a home or a coffee shop or a co-working network. And so the mitigations against that type of threat is to you is to have your people use a virtual private network. Um, and you probably heard commercials for ExpressVPN, OpenVPN, um, NordVPN. Um, I mean, there's there's quite a few good ones out there, uh, but VPN is a very very good uh, mitigation against that particular threat because all of the traffic is going to be encrypted um, before it leaves the computer. Um, whereas even if uh, even if the traffic, you know, going to and from a particular website is encrypted, if you're at a co-working place and their network gets breached or is actively being sniffed, the sequence of URLs that are going through is going to be part of what's captured, what is breached. And oftentimes there's data flowing through a non-encrypted channel before you actually get into an encrypted channel. You don't want to rely on every individual website for that. So you want to hide the traffic. Um, if you're at home, if you have if you have employees or you and yourself are completely at home, then it's a really, really good idea to be working in a uh, in a network or a VLAN, a network environment that has as few devices as possible on it. Um, and you have to make a you have to make a decision that you're going to trust your internet service provider to your home. Um, because if they get breached, then all your traffic gets, uh, all the traffic logs get leaked. Well, that's a big issue. But if we have one network at home, or if we just use the default configuration, the default Wi-Fi router, um, we've, seen, we've seen homes with, with dozens of IoT devices. You got the Amazon Echo and the Google devices and um, smart switches, every device under the sun. And... These these consumer level devices are not are not all created equal, and and most of them are just getting to market. And you know we're we're gonna hear stories about about the breaches of those, and then there's a little bit of code running on a little computer inside a smart switch that's constantly scanning your network and trying to find vulnerabilities. And so the one if you work remotely, then what you can do is you can take your own computer and you can put it behind a router. Or, or configure the router that you have to be an isolated network with with no traffic back to the regular Wi-Fi with all those all those uh, smart devices on there. Okay, another threat that I want to talk about is compromised passwords. Um, this is one another one where you should assume it's happening. Um, the the modern the popular browsers are now giving you some help. Apple's giving some help. Google's and Microsoft. Um, where there's there's uh, notifications now that your password has leaked, and um, you know you can go to you can go to um, you know those those browsers and the password lists. Uh, actually, LastPass, a password manager, um, it also has a built-in feature that will that will scour certain lists that are known to share passwords, and it will see if it can find um, find a leaked password. But uh, you want to, you definitely want to use LastPass or another password manager. You don't want to rely on remembering things because if you rely on remember, remembering it, then your password is going to be weaker than using, you know, a really long string of gobbledygook that uh, is just cryptographically harder to brute force. And then, of course, um, you want to expect that your passwords are going to be breached at some point for at least some account. And so to mitigate that, use two-factor authentication. Um, now, uh, it, is, it is true that when you're on an airplane, uh, sometimes you can't get text messages or the text message channel is different from the Wi-Fi channel in a few cases, but most of the time, it works good, but but also um, adding in authentication apps um, is a good practice as well. And then uh, with a phone, there are known attacks where a if if you leave your phone alone for any given period of time, somebody can grab your phone, pop your SIM card out, quickly clone it, and then put your SIM card back in. And when this happens, 
now somebody else can get all of your text messages. Now that's a that's an intentionally targeted attack, but a simple mitigation that you can do for that is to take a little piece of clear tape and put it over your um, SIM card door. And then of course, most people have a case on top of that, but at a minimum, it makes the attacker's job just a little bit harder. It takes it longer for them to do it. And you will know if it happened. And if you see that it happened, then you'll know to, to go and start resetting passwords and go and get a different SIM card and things like that. Okay, let's talk about code security. And uh, the first threat that I want to talk to talk about with code security is unintended access. Now we're getting into the code. All right. Whether it be GitHub or Azure repos or anything else, um, you do want to use team-based access for each repo. And in the, in the uh, authorization, you, know, you can add individual people in GitHub. And so the recommendation is don't do that. Create teams and authorize the team to the repositories because what ends up happening is there are a lot of Git repositories that a particular development team needs access to. And especially with the popularity of smaller and more segmented architectures, whether they be, you know, whether you intentionally call it microservices or, um, or whether you've weathered the storm of the going too far on the pendulum swing towards microservices and have started to come back already. Either way, it is a definite trend across our industry that larger and larger code bases are being broken up into smaller code bases. And so when you do that, you have multiple Git repositories and you need to give the development team access to each one. And so create a team and then, and then uh, share or, or give access to the team to each repository. That way, when a team member leaves the organization, removing, from, removing them from the team automatically removes their access from the code in all of the different Git repositories. Also, make sure you do have enterprise class logins that support two-factor authentication for your code repositories. Um, and then uh, even if a person is still with your organization, if they're not active in the code anymore, go ahead and remove them from that team. And so don't name your teams as people who are part of the organization, name your teams for what they do. And that way, when somebody changes what they're responsible for doing, well, then that maps with removing them from the team. All right, the next threat is malware injection. Um, we've seen that uh, just in the last year with the huge uaparser.js hack in NPM. And uh, now NuGet is just as susceptible to it, but it just happens to be that NPM has, has been in the news uh, a couple of times over the last few years where a seemingly small library that started out with just one committer, somebody that just threw up an open source project, and then some other libraries took a dependency on it, and then those other libraries became really, really popular. And now because they became really popular, you've got so many applications that now have a transitive dependency on this one little library developed by one person. Um, and then that one person either has a compromised account or something happens and, and the account responsible for publishing new versions of that library to NPM gets compromised. Some code is inserted and put in there. And then over time, as libraries get updated, this hack is now running in tons and tons of applications. And uh, just knowing that I, I've, I've published some, um, you know, NuGet libraries and, uh, you know, it's, it's, the same thing with that. If, if you don't have, if you don't have some good governance on, on the NuGet account with, with two-factor authentication and good password, and monitoring it, then you know, it's very possible to happen. And it's happened twice now in a high-profile way with package managers, because the default tooling is 
encouraging us to constantly update these libraries, just like our smartphones are constantly encouraging us to update all these apps. Oh, the app worked fine, but there's a new version. Oh, I guess, and then the phone doesn't even ask anymore. It just, it just updates, okay? And then we have malware injection. So for that threat, um, first of all, you wanna talk about that with the team. Because if you haven't had our conversations about that, then you're not gonna have good awareness. But you want to insist on pull requests um, for every change. Don't commit directly to master, insist on pull requests. Feature branches, pull requests, uh, because then you can see the changes to your CS proj file and you can see that a new version of a particular package was coming through. And if that particular feature didn't require that new version to come through, then you can question it. And if you are intentionally upgrading libraries, that's great. Let's go down the chain of everything that we're updating and make sure that it's as we, as we expected. All right. Um, another mitigation is to package the applications with their dependencies rather than link the dependencies at deploy time or even at build time. Um, now the default, the default uh, build cadence is to do a .NET restore and then .NET build or a NuGet restore and then compile. That saves a little disk space in your Git repository, but it leaves the source of the packages at NuGet. And um, there's, you know, there's an argument in the industry still about whether we should check in all of the libraries in our own applications Git repository or whether we should get them from NuGet every time. Now, Microsoft has made the decision that for their purposes, they're gonna make the default be get it from NuGet every time. But um, if you do check in the packages to your local Git repository, it does close that attack vector, okay? So when we're talking about threats and techniques to mitigate the threat, that is a technique to mitigate that threat. The next is static code analysis. Um, when it comes to uaparser.js or any of the others, all of the libraries and all of the current code for the open source libraries can be scanned. And there are really, really good static code analysis tools out there. Um, SonarCube is one of them. And you can read up about their, their security features at, at their website, sonarcube.org slash features slash security. All right, so those are some specific things in your code. And from a process perspective, I mentioned doing pull requests. This is what that process looks like for a, um, a build process um, and, and pull request. So before I get into the pull request process, we have our private build and we have our CI build, continuous integration build. They kind of do the same things. They just run on a different environment. The private build runs on a programmer's workstation and the CI build runs on a team shared server, whether it's Azure pipelines or GitHub Actions. And, and just like a higher order test in test driven development, we know that the pattern is arrange, act, assert. So we do some things to get ready to do an act and then we do some assertions. The act, the big, the big act is compile the code, move from text source code to uh, bytecode. And then the asserts are unit tests and integration tests. And then um, upon success there on the integration build, we do our static code analysis, which in some teams, as you get more mature about that, you can move that over to the assert column where you fail the build if you don't have, uh, if you have any static code analysis warnings. But then after that, we publish the test results, we package it up as a named and numbered release candidate, and then we publish it out to Azure Artifacts. So for pull request, that process is, is as follows. And this process is a defect removal process in general. But when we're thinking about security flaws or security breaches, uh, we think about that as a defect, okay? Um, and even if it hasn't happened yet, if we can reason through and say that, you know, we are unreasonably vulnerable to a particular threat, well, we can classify that as a defect and make sure that it gets fixed. But, uh, but you can see the pull request process um, goes all the way through the CI, the CI build um, from the engineer workstation, and then to our first deployed environment so that we can run full system acceptance tests. And then once that happens, then the team member is able to create a pull request um, because there is a, 
a beta level build or non-releasable build that is packaged up and deployed to our um, automated test environment. I tend to call it the TDD environment to invoke test-driven development. Um, and and we, we enable builds and deployments on every branch, not just the master branch. And so then we create the pull request, have another team member look at it with a checklist, okay? Heart surgeons and airline pilots use checklists before they do their jobs. Actually, the more complex and the more professional a, um, uh, a job is, the more likely it is to have a standardized checklist. And software surely is sophisticated. And especially when you're thinking about security, um, the stakes are high, you want the checklist, okay? So create a checklist for what the criteria by which you are going to accept the pull request and make sure that it checks the box. And the person who's approving that pull request is basically staking their reputation on the fact that they verified that all those checklist items uh, were verified and they click the button to merge and complete the pull request. All right, let's move on to document security. For, um, for, for documents, um, you know, the threat is, is the, that someone gets access to documents and, and you don't want that. Uh, when it comes to Dropbox and OneDrive and Google Drive, technically they, uh, they, they synchronize the files, but I want to highlight OneDrive. And, and I don't actually know, I haven't studied in detail the depth to which uh, Box or Dropbox or Google Drive have implemented this, but we do know, we have verified that OneDrive does support HIPAA um, auditing and uh, HIPAA required controls. And so uh, there's, there's two things with OneDrive. OneDrive is the file synchronization, but it is actually built on top of the SharePoint infrastructure, which is actually quite old. Microsoft acquired what would become SharePoint um, a while ago and is built, built on top of it. But of course, accessing documents through the SharePoint UI um, was, was really clunky. And so OneDrive, Kind of made the interface uh, a lot better and added folder structures and lots of other other goodies. But SharePoint over OneDrive adds team-based access for more granularity. So you can create your teams, you can add people to the teams, and then grant uh, SharePoint uh, projects which own OneDrive folders, and you can you can use that granularity of access. And then once somebody leaves the team. It all flows through and you can do that nicely. Um, without, without the SharePoint security features, it's a little bit more clunky with OneDrive. And I think by extension, um, Box and Dropbox and Google Drive, um, you, know, you can do it, it just takes more work. And then um, you also need to think about local downloads and email attachments because you, you do have you know, emails and local workstation security. And so, um, that comes back to the physical security of the computer. Do you have BitLocker? Do you have domain access? And do you have just policies or way of working which tend to limit the number of documents that just stay on somebody's hard drive? Um, you might even consider, you know, having a an automated script that runs on a schedule to um, auto delete things in your own downloads folder because everywhere on the web. There's some, when you download something, it tends to go to your Windows download folder. And so you can just help yourself by having an automated job that runs, you know, whatever, however periodically is appropriate for you and just clear out the, the downloads folder because anything important is going to end up in an appropriate OneDrive folder anyway, I think. All right, let's talk about deployment security. So you already have a build, you already have a release candidate, you've done your code scanning. And now we need to deploy to a series of environments, ultimately ending up in a production environment. We don't want to have anything sensitive stored in source code, okay? Now that's probably, that shouldn't have to be said in 2022, I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, you don't want credentials or anything that is slightly secret in Git repository. That's, that's that's um, 
means app settings.json, any of the config files, you want to make sure that the only keys that are in there are, are ones that have you know, no impact. They're only development level keys for an individual workstation that are totally meaningless outside, you know, if somebody gets full access to the source code. You want to use a, a some type of secret store, Azure Key Vault or LastPass in order to store and retrieve and poke those settings in on the fly. Now, um, if you are able to dynamically use Azure Key Vault when applications start up to retrieve some credentials, that's great. And that's gonna, that's gonna close your attack vector a lot. Um, there's a lot of applications out there where you gotta have the secret in a config file in production. Um, if you can encrypt that config file, that's a good mitigation. But at a minimum for applications where you just have to put that um, security key in app settings.json in production, and, and there's a lot of them, okay? There's a lot of them. You want to make sure that that is stored in a secret key with masking in uh, Azure Pipelines or Octopus Deploy. Both of them support one-way only encryption from the UI where they're stored in a, uh, a secret variable for the purposes of poking them into the app settings.json file, but there's no way that any users of application pipelines or, or sorry, Azure Pipelines or Octopus Deploy are gonna be able to get that key out. Uh, now, once you have fully automated deployments using either one of these tools, then's the time to make sure that you don't accidentally have unnecessary production environment access from any of your team members. If you don't have automated deployments all the way through production, then that's a, a huge gap now because you have humans that are handling the security keys for every deployment. You wanna get that automated. Okay, um, on build level variables like connection strings that do embed a particular secret, like, like a password, um, refactor them out so that the connection string is built on the fly from multiple other variables. Don't repeat the connection string and thereby repeat the secret because then you have to mark the whole connection string as secret and then nobody can even see what it is and then you start to slow down developer productivity. All right, I think we covered all that. Okay, so with this process, there is one mistake that we still see people in 2022 making when it comes to implementing deployment automation. And the mistake that we see some people still doing is building from source code to production or going back to source code to build to the TDD environment or build in order to deploy to the UAT environment. Uh, if, if continuous integration is implemented properly, you will build once and deploy many. You will build once for a particular change, a particular commit in the Git repository and you will create a deployable set of release candidate packages. If your application is super simple and only has a web application and a SQL Server database, then you're gonna have two things to deploy. One deploys on a database server, one deploys on, a, on Azure App Service. And so you have two things to deploy and two um, packages. Every time your deployment automation uh, goes to deploy a particular release number, it should go to Azure Artifacts, to your NuGet server, or go to the NuGet server built into Octopus Deploy and grab that particular release candidate and then deploy the two different deployable pieces to your web application and database. That way, the deployment is doing the exact same process every time, is deploying the exact same release candidate and there is no attack vector that is possible between the build and production. And it doesn't even matter if something did get compromised in a down-level NuGet package because the dependencies 
have already been 100% embedded in the release candidate NuGet package, the scanned and verified copies of those libraries will be deployed all the way through to production. Whereas if you have anywhere a NuGet restore happening, then you may get a different version of a library between the time you had your uh, CI build succeed and the time you actually put that build number in production. You don't want to open that attack vector. And that's why you want to build once, deploy many, because your build is your verification and you want to create your release candidate packages and save them and use them. All right, the stride model. If you haven't heard uh, of the stride model, it's an acronym and it's spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. Uh, we could do a whole another one to two hour webinar just on the stride model. So if you're not familiar with it at all, then just do some, do some uh, internet research and I'm sure you'll find plenty of information about it. But that is a way of thinking about the threats that you may need to design a security feature around. Ask yourself, in what ways could an attacker spoof an identity? In what ways could an attacker attempt to tamper with data? In what way could an attacker do something and then repudiate that it was done or deny that they were the ones that did it or make it look like somebody else did it. So it's, it's a way of thinking so that you can design, you can identify threats for your particular software and then help you to design uh, software features. And when I say software features, I'm including code that runs in your cloud infrastructure because it's all code, it's all automation, it's all something that you would put in your Git repository and, and ultimately get into production. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the stride model. Um, just the, the last three, just for those who might not be familiar with the information disclosure is an information break or data leak. Um, and, and because of it, public trust and, and thereby revenue can drop drastically when we see that happening. Denial of service is the system going offline by the actions of an attacker and elevation of privilege is uh, is coming in, an attacker coming in with a lower level of access and then maneuvering in some way to get their account elevated so that they can do more things. Okay. Um, when you're laying out a process, a product management process, which Product management is kind of the beginning of DevOps, even though it doesn't have any DevOps automation. So a lot of times it's not talked about in the same, in the same paragraph, but everything that is deployed is envisioned in the product management process. So if somebody in product management says, well, we need the application to be secure, or you need to expand that conversation and talk about, well, what are we looking to avoid? Obviously data breaches. What are we looking to accomplish? Well, we need a particular, we need to pass a particular audit. Like, we need to do a PCI audit. We need to do a SOC 2 process. We need to get some FERPA documentation because we're operating in the K-12 education space. Whatever it happens to be, whatever the objectives are, state those objectives and then back it out to some product backlog items, some features that can then be designed with the hope of accomplishing those outcomes. And these are the main stages that any feature needs to go through for, for software, but let's, let's talk about it through the lens of a security feature. And I'm gonna show you a different view. Um, from a process perspective, there's four different types of design activities. The conceptual definition is what some, a lot of people think of, you know, requirements gathering. Just think of the requirements, the business requirements. User experience design is how is a person going to interact with it? Technical design is architecture, design patterns, uh, what libraries we're going to use. And then acceptance criteria or test design is, uh, is asking the question, how do we know that we're done? And how do we know that it does everything that we needed to? Um, and designing those scenarios to check in pre-production environments before we actually get into code. 
All right, so if we lay that process out on some swim lanes, out on a Kanban style board, then we have columns for each of these activities where we have conceptual definition, which is business level requirements, user experience design, technical design, test design, and then development. So if you're taking the uh, security feature of uh, making, it, making it possible to detect when an attacker is doing a brute force password attack, trying to get into a user's online banking account, you know, we would, we would talk about the threat situation and conceptual definition, the fact that this does happen, maybe some data around how many times we found out that it happened last year. The user experience would, you know, we'd want to annotate the login screen and maybe the text that would pop up if it's happening. Maybe we want to warn the user that, uh, you know, if they have one more attempt that's wrong, it's going to lock their account and they have to do, you know, do something so legitimate users can kind of pause and, and try to maybe go back to their password manager and get their password or, or do the reset password loop. Technical design are things like, well, I'm going to have to remember when the last time they had a failed password attempt. So I'm probably going to have to add a piece of data to the current database schema. So you see those are the different types of, so it's just regular feature development. And then the test design is designing test scenarios of go through and log in fine, go through and um, you know have five bad password attempts within one minute, uh, just all kinds of various scenarios. And so you design what you expect to happen. And the, again, the trick here is to translate from an objective, which is don't let bad things happen, and analyze what all your threats are and design features to do two things. One is make it less likely that the threat will come to fruition. And the second is if the threat does actually occur, lessen the impact if it occurs. Design features around that. And now, now you have a security backlog. All right. Uh, something else you need to know is the OWASP top 10. And we we always, at Clear Measure, we always try to simplify complex topics. And there's other people also that have simplified um, simplified these, these security concepts. And OWASP is one of the organizations that have done a good job of it. And they've constantly published the top 10, um, the top 10 uh, most frequently successful attacks. And and so in 2017, they had a, uh, a survey. And in 2021, they had a survey. And not only did they publish the top 10 security vulnerabilities that are um, you know, successfully exploited, but they also published the differences. And so we see that injection, um, now SQL injection is the most common type of injection, but um, injecting code uh, was number one in 2017. It's still on the top 10 list, but it lost two spaces. Uh, broken access control went from number five to number one from 2017 to 2021. And there are three new problems in 2021, insecure design, software and data integrity failures, and server-side request forgery. Those are the new ones. And... Uh, um, the ones with the the ones with the dotted lines were kind of eliminated and merged in with some others. But anyway, if you are not if you have not studied the OWASP top ten, there's plenty of good material out there, and I encourage you to do that. All right, let's end on runtime security. Um, and this is you're in production and you're running your application, and you definitely want to use a, a data center which is which is giving you a lot of security controls for you. Um, obviously, Azure does a great job about it, and you can piggyback off of Azure's um, security certifications and audits, and pretty much any security audit that you would need to, to tackle, Azure has already gone through those processes, and you can take the results of those audits and use those as part of your compliance uh, process. But um, Microsoft, in Azure provides security recommendations built into every one of the services. So use those. Um, and also um, you, can use, uh, you can use Azure Sentinel um, as you know, one of the 
one of the security information event management systems, um, abbreviated, you can pronounce it SEAM. Um, but those are, those are systems that actually track a security event, a detected, a detected attack, or if, it, or if it thinks that it's attack, and so you can log those. And then one thing that you need to do early on in your architecture is to decide what constitutes an alert and what constitutes an alarm. An alert is kind of like a warming, warning, and an alarm is an error, but applied not from code compilation, but to production. And an alert is something that people need to know about, and then the people decide if action is needed. An alarm is clear cut, and it's blaring out to everybody, hey, action is needed now, okay, that's an alarm. And you need to intentionally decide what constitutes an alert and what constitutes an alarm, okay? You do not wanna put, well, you can put alerts in your logs, but you do not want to rely on scanning logs just to look at alerts. You want alerts to be broadcasted and you want alarms to pull all of the fire bells and send text messages and all hands on deck. This is, this is a big event. And then you wanna maintain a formal on-call schedule because if you have an alarm go off, and all of the phone numbers and emails are getting lit up, but you don't have anybody who's actually paying attention to those phone numbers or emails, then you've got a big gap. So you wanna maintain a formal on-call schedule so that you have someone who's, who, whose job it is to um, respond immediately to alarms and to evaluate the alerts. All right. So as we close, um, you know, I want to encourage you, if, if all of this seems overwhelming, just start doing something. Um, you know, determine somebody who's on call. Don't, don't ask at the time of an alert, you know, who can handle this? You just kind of determine that. And be before code is written, uh, design in decisions about those and, uh, and, and just start iterating with your team. Okay. That is a lot of information. Uh, we barely got it in on time. And um, I love answering questions. And so send me emails, jeffrey at clear-measure.com. And, uh, and, and whether I can answer it in email form or whether we need to get on the phone and answer an email. If you want a copy of my book, .NET DevOps for Azure, an electronic copy of the book, then go ahead and do that. And um, I believe that the questions that came in on Q&A were able to be answered uh, as we are going through, I think we've answered all of them. Thank you so much for being here. We had a good, like a really tremendous crowd for this topic. Security is so important and uh, it's important to properly address it and properly embed it into your, into your DevOps environment. So thank you all again and uh, stay tuned for the next Clear Measure webinar. Again, we're a software architecture firm that that seeks to um, empower software teams. We want you to be able to move fast, to deliver consistent quality and run your software with confidence. And you can do it. You can do it. So thanks so much for being here. God bless.